Father, I pray that you give me the gift of teaching this morning, Lord, and give the folks ears to hear and then a heart receptive. Our Heavenly Father, you say, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Lord, we're asking for wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, not that, but thy wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you'll turn the book of Daniel chapter 2 with me this morning, we'll go back to where we left off. Daniel chapter number 2. And uh, Daniel chapter number 2 and verse number, uh, in verse number 43, if you remember last week we talked about the, the image that was raised up in the plains of Dura. And uh, we talked about also this image that Daniel saw, or that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw and Daniel interpreted. The image represents the uh, times of the Gentiles starting at 606 B.C. and running until, um, until a stone that is cut out of the mountain smites the image on its feet. So with all of their pomp and all of their glory and all of their majesty and all of their, uh, of their uh, power and might, the Gentile kingdoms are going to come to an abrupt end yeah. overnight. Right. And that's the way it's going to happen. It's not going to be a slow, gradual uh, disintegration. Because one kingdom takes over another kingdom. The kingdoms of this world right now are, are fighting for power. Yeah, yeah. And so you can see it. And, uh, but that's, that's the way it's going to happen. It's going to be cataclysmic. It's going to be an event. And the event, of course, is tied to the second advent of Christ. Because the stone cut out of the mountain is the Lord Jesus. The stone the builders rejected. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for those that don't know him. But to us, he's the rock of Deuteronomy 32. He is our rock, and we stand firmly on him. Amen. And on one, it grinds to powder. On the other, it stands as a foundation. That's the way the Word of God is. On one hand, being a double, sharp, two-edged sword. On one hand, it blesses, cuts, prunes, and uh, delivers the saint of God. On the other, it destroys that one who is in rebellion against God. So the stone's cut out of the mountain, and it smites the image on its feet. It's foundation. So the Gentile foundations are going to be destroyed. And when that, when that happens, the kingdom will, a kingdom will come that will replace it. And the kingdom that replaces it is the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ. And this is another reason that I believe that I am premillennial. Because if you'll notice, there's nothing gradual about the changing of kingdoms. Notice the kingdom is immediate. A, new, a kingdom comes forth from this that is to rule the world. And uh, the idea that by preaching the gospel you're going to convert the world and bring the world into the kingdom of Christ is a utopian vision that has no basis in the Bible, none whatsoever. We're not going to convert the world. The world's converting the church. You know that as well as I do. But the kingdoms of this world will be changed from the Gentile powers over to the Lord Christ, the Lord Jesus, and with the Jews as head of the, all the nations. And in chapter number uh, 2 of the book of Daniel and verse number 43, Thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, and they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, the biggest controversy, one of the biggest controversies in the Bible is who the they are. Who are the they that will mingle themselves with the seed of men? But notice the wording. didn't say that they will, they will mingle themselves with men. Could have, but it didn't. The scripture says that they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. Yeah. The Greek word for seed is sperma, and uh, and that's uh, and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, zira, I think, is the Old Testament Hebrew word for seed, and it has to do with what's planted or placed to bring forth fruit, and the life is in itself. Life is in the seed. They found seed buried in these uh, in these. Uh, uh, pyramids over here in Egypt, thousands of years old, that can still germinate. The reason they can is because the Creator, the Almighty, has built life into the seed. And so therefore we are the seed of Christ. He had one seed, that seed's Abraham. Through Abraham's faith, Christ came into the world. Christ was born of the faith of Abraham. Because Abraham believed God. And by faith, the uh, uh, Mary, who was a virgin daughter of Zion, 
by the same faith Abraham had, Mary received that seed by faith. And if Mary had rejected that seed, Christ would not have been incarnate through the Virgin Mary. Man had nothing to do with it. It was completely a spiritual thing where the seed was implanted within her. And she bore uh, nine months later the God-man. But this seed that mingles itself with the, with the seed of men, uh, the first time this happened was in Genesis chapter number 6 when the angels, sons of God, saw the daughters of men, came to them and cohabited with them and the Nephilim were born. The Nephilim are the Hebrew, from the Hebrew word Naphal, and it's translated giants in Genesis chapter number 6. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. <laughs> These giants are one, of the, are one of the most well attested things on the earth and one of the most hidden. Most history classes gloss over the giants as if they never existed. But all you have to do is just do a, just a little bit of reading and you'll be amazed at the amount of information available to show you the giants that have lived and are living on this earth. And these giants, of course, are directly connected with the fall of these angels in Genesis 6. The Hebrew word nafal is a verb, means fallen or to fall. That's where we get the term Nephilim. And I'm sure most of you have heard the word Nephilim. And you've, there's some books been written called The Return of the Nephilim. I think, uh, 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 what's his name of the Cornelia House? Uh, uh, Chuck uh, Missler. Missler. Thank you. Missler, the Cornelia House, has done a lot of work on that. It's got a lot of good material available. And by the way, you ought to pray for his wife because she's got cancer. And uh, he's got a, pa a page about that. His wife, I think her name is uh, Nancy Missler. Nancy. What? Nancy. Nancy. So please remember her in prayer. But in any event, there's a lot of material available about the Nephilim. The Nephilim are not fallen angels. The Nephilim are the product of fallen angels right. and humanity. Now immediately somebody says, well, how in the world could this be? How in the world could a spirit being like that, an angel, produce a, 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 a hybrid type human being? Well, how could a spirit being like Almighty God produce a human man? <laughs> Amen? Think on it for a while. And think a little deeper into it. Everything that exists... That, you, that, you, that we're even conscious of, and there is so much that we're not conscious of. Everything that exists came forth from an eternal, invisible spirit being <coughs> spoken into existence. Right. So the union of angels and women uh, produced the Nephilim. Now there's a lot of material out there like the book of Jasher, the book of Enoch. And these are what's called apocryphal books. Uh, apocryphal means hidden books. They're not part of the canon of Scripture. The Roman Catholic Church has more books than we do, and they include some of these as canon. The word canon means straight like a gun barrel. That's what it means. In other words, it's straight. It's Scripture. It's the Word of God. That's why we call it the canon of Scripture. We've got 66 books. We stopped at 66. That's enough. The problem is that a lot of these other books that, that claim to be uh, Scripture, thus saith the Lord, and all these other things, have problems with the revealed Word of God, with inspired Scripture. So the canon of Scripture is closed with the book of Revelation. But the book of Enoch does exist. And the book of Enoch has been quoted. And I've quoted it in here. It's been quoted many times down through the centuries. The book of Enoch was found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. How many of you know where the Dead Sea Scrolls came? And uh, they were found in, over a period of time from about 1945, 46, 47, period of time. They found them at a place called Qumran next to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea Scrolls quite revealing because they showed the mindset of these Jews who had separated themselves from the temple 2,000 years ago. But one of the books included with the Dead Sea Scrolls was the Book of Enoch. So that means the Book of Enoch is old. It's old. It's ancient. It's not some new thing that's been written. The reason it's important is because the Book of Enoch goes into detail about the relationship of these angels with human beings. And what happened then? And the way they looked, even to the color of their eyes, and things of that nature. 
And it really gets into detail. And you have to be awful careful, though. Here's the problem. You've got to be very careful when you're quoting something that's not Scripture. It doesn't mean that they don't have elements of the truth. But the, the only way that you can be safe is to take whatever they say and compare it with the Bible. If it agrees with Scripture, if it doesn't cross the Bible, okay. But if it begins to cross the Bible or not agree with the Word of God, then out the door with it. Because I firmly believe in the canon of Scripture, folks, 66 books. But in any event, the book of Enoch, the book of Jasser, and some other books make reference to these Nephilim, to these fallen creatures. Now remember again, a Nephilim is not a fallen angel. A Nephilim is a product of a fallen angel and a human being. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that God visited them and destroyed them. He did because they were neither human nor angel. They're hybrids. But see, that gets into the, they shall mix themselves or mingle themselves with the seed of men. The idea is that they cross over a barrier from what they are and mix with humanity, with mankind. Now, when God made these creatures, and we're creatures, He made seraphim, He made cherubim, He made angels, He made archangels. Then He made mankind, us. He made the animals. He made everything that breathes. He made everything that lives, everything that exists. He made it all. He's the author of life. But he made these things differently. In other words, a cherubim is not an angel. A lot of people just gloss over that and, and call the devil a fallen angel. He's not. He's a fallen cherubim. <coughs> He's the fifth cherub. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, he said in Ezekiel 28. Is a cherub different from an angel? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is a seraphim different from a cherubim? Absolutely. A seraphim is a ball of fire. <laughs> Isaiah 6, flying in the temple, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. But then we go further and we get into demons, daimonion in the New Testament. Most of the new Bibles don't translate the word. They simply give you the word demon. That's literally transliterating is what they're doing. It's taking it out of the Greek language and just simply taking it letter for letter, if they can find a corresponding letter, letter for letter out of Greek into English. So when you come to the word demon, you think to yourself, well, what is a demon? That's another big point of controversy. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. What is a demon? Well, if you go back to Plato and you go back to the Greek philosophers, 2, 300 B.C., they taught that a demon, now remember, you're in 2013. You read the Bible. You're looking backward. Your, your culture today is vastly different from the culture of 300 B.C. If Plato or one of these Greek philosophers or sages of, 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 uh, of the Greek world started talking about a demon, they would be speaking of it in a positive context because they knew that it was the source of knowledge. Gnosis, gnosko, to get to know. You know, agnostic, the one who does not know. That's what an agnostic is. Gnosis is to know. So a demon, 200, 300 B.C. in the Greek world, was considered a good thing, something to be desired because it provided knowledge. And especially through the, through the ceremonies of the initiate, when they were initiated into the mystery religions, one big part of that initiation was the receiving of a demon. I mean, they became demon-possessed. For example, if you go to the Sistine Chapel right now, which is over there in Rome, and I must confess to you in a heartbeat, that's some of the most beautiful art in the world. I've, I've never been there, but I've viewed it. I've viewed uh, photographs of it. It's beautiful. Michelangelo was an outstanding artist. And he painted the Sistine Chapel about 1508, 1509 A.D. He painted the Sistine Chapel to give a panoramic view of the creation and everything apparently as it relates to the Creator. Apparently there's a story behind all that's painted across the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. All right, so far as that goes, that's fine. But here's the problem. When you look up into that Sistine Chapel, you're going to find Ezekiel. You're going to find Isaiah. You're going to find Daniel. You're going to find Joel. Now, who are these men? Prophets from where? 
What kind of prophets are they? They're Hebrew Old Testament inspired prophets that wrote the Word of God, right? That sets them in a class of their own, doesn't it? The Bible said in the book of Romans chapter number 9, to the Jew was committed the oracles of God. An oracle, oracular confession, what oracular means to speak forth. The oracle of God is a speaking forth, is a giving forth of knowledge, of understanding, of wisdom. And so the Bible said to the Jew, Romans 9, was committed the oracle of God. That means that God is speaking through the Jewish people. Specifically through their prophets. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, all these prophets we accept as inspired scripture. They're Hebrew prophets. But here's the problem. When you look up the Sistine Chapel, you'll find all these Hebrew prophets, but along with them you're going to find Sybil. Now who is Sybil? Well, Sybil is from the ancient Greek word Sibylle, which means a prophetess or a prophet. And when you look up at the ceiling at the Sistine Chapel, you're going to find, you're going to find the Delphic Sibyl next to one of the Hebrew prophets. Then you're going to find another Sibyl next to a Hebrew prophet. Then you're going to find another Sibyl next to a Hebrew prophet. What have you done? You've elevated a pagan Sibyl to the same place as a Hebrew prophet. Is there a problem with that? Big deal. Amen. Big problem. Now, who do you blame for this? I don't know if you can blame Michelangelo for it because he wasn't the Pope. He was working under the orders of the Pope. He's an artist. And, you know, Michelangelo probably just doing what he was told to do. Uh, the source of the, of the corruption, I don't know. I, I'm sure, obviously, that the Pope was fully aware of what goes on to his Sistine Chapel ceiling and all that. I'm sure of that. No question about that. I mean, if somebody came into the church here and started painting a uh, a satanic symbol on the side of the wall, you folks get upset, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, you don't want to be associated with anything like that. That's the point. So why come into the Sistine Chapel and go up to the ceiling of it and put a sibyl next to a Hebrew prophet? Now here's the point. That's the source of knowledge. That's the source. That's where it's coming from. So the idea is that here God speaks, here's God, here's the Creator. You know, you know, you've seen the famous one where God the Father's hand is touching Adam when he creates him. Yeah. His finger touching. Okay, here's, here's the source of light. Here's God, the light dwelling in the light. And he is, he is giving knowledge, revelation to mankind. He gives it through Isaiah. He gives it through Jeremiah. He gives it through Daniel. Then he gives it through the Delphic Sibyl, on and on and on. See the problem? Now you begin to understand why the Roman Catholic Church has always had more of a source of authority than simply the Bible. Protestants and Baptists have clung to Scripture. And something gets outside the Bible, folks, I may look at it, I may even read it, and I may even study it. But as far as believing it is concerned, I believe this book. Amen. This book I believe. I believe it from cover to cover, folks. I believe the Bible. Amen. Well, that's a big deal because it's the source of authority. That's what we're talking about. You have a question, brother? Okay. Okay, so when you look at Enoch... You know, I'll give you all that to, to understand what's going on with Enoch, Jasser, and the rest of these books. First and Second Maccabees, the Apocryphal, the Pseudepigraphic Writings, all of these things. There's, a, there's, there's all kinds of books out there, old books, ancient books that are not Scripture. <coughs> but every single occult religion, I don't care who it is and where it came from, appeals to pagan wisdom along with mixing in the Bible mm -hmm. to produce their religion. Albert Pike was a master of it. Yeah. Albert Pike was a synthesizer. What's that mean? He took all of the religions, and since he was the, he was the smartest man on earth, <laughs> he took all of the pagan religions and he pulled what he wanted to from each one, and then he created his own religion. 
And it's back here in my office called the Morals and Dogma. Yeah. That's what it is. Amen. And so therefore, when Albert Pike says, God, be careful. Yes. Because if it's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh -huh. he's not the true God. You've got to watch that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, see, that's where the Mormons get their, the Mormons get their doctrine of uh, physical relationship product, and uh, then humanity is a product of it. And it's Isis and Osiris that produced Horus. And Horus is the counterpart of uh, Apollo. And Apollo is the Apollyon. In the book of, of uh, Revelation chapter number 9, verse 11, Apollyon is the angel of destruction. And the, uh, I think it's called... The Cumian, the Cumian oracle, the Cumian Sibyl uh, is a priestess that worships Apollo, Apollyon. Now make the connection. Revelation chapter number 9, Abaddon, Hebrew, Apollyon, Greek, is the angel of the bottomless pit. There's nothing good about that, is there? Why would you have on the ceiling of your Sistine Chapel a Sibyl? Cumian Sibyl. When you get home, look it up. The Cumian Sibyl, who is the priestess of Apollyon as a source of wisdom and authority and revelation from God. See what I mean? You see where you get. So, what's all that mean? It means that there is a source of authority and knowledge in the Roman Catholic Church that does not originate with God, Amen. the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what it means. Yes, sir. Okay, so that brings us to the capital, the rotunda of the capital, and to the and to the and to the uh, uh, obelisk, and it brings you to St. Peter's Square, shaped in the form of a key, and the rotunda and the obelisk, and again there's a picture of the fertility production. The obelisk is representative of, of, of male fertility, and the rotunda of the womb, and on it goes. Yes, sir. Well, the whole idea, again, is that they go into the pagan world to seek wisdom, to seek knowledge, to seek understanding. And, uh, and God condemns it. He condemns it uh, thoroughly, without question. You don't go to the Egyptians, and you don't seek to the Babylonians, and you don't turn to the Persians. You turn to the Word of God. And, this, and the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, the Son of God, in whom is bound up all the treasures of wisdom in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, for, and the big difference between wisdom and knowledge, knowledge, both have knowledge. Wisdom must have knowledge and facts, but wisdom knows how to use it. <laughs> knowledge is like a loose cannon on the top of a ship. It knows something but has no clue where it came from, where it's going, and no way to, to control it or use it. So this is the problem. The problem is that when these angels came down, they brought with them hidden knowledge. 
they brought with them knowledge that mankind was not supposed to have. Remember, the day you eat, he, she, the, the serpent said, when you eat this fruit, God doth know that you shall be as God, yeah. knowing good and evil. Right. You're going to have knowledge you didn't have. Right. All right? And the Bible says that knowledge is earthly, sensual, and devilish. So the Jew has what's called the uh, Kabbalah that this brother mentioned a moment ago. And the book of the Kabbalah, because every occultism has its book, is the Zohar. And the Zohar is the, is the, uh, is the, uh, the Bible of Kabbalism. A lot of the Hollywood uh, actors and actresses now seem to be fascinated with that because it's spiritual, and it's different, it's, it's unique. Most, most Americans, if you, ask most, if you ask most Americans, what's the Zohar? You know, that you'd, get every, you'd get every answer from, well, it's something you eat or <laughs> some guy over here in a this or that. Don't have a clue. The Zohar is old. But the Zohar, the, basis of the, the basic premise of the Zohar, which is the book of the Kabbalistic uh, branch of Judaism, is based on Eastern mysticism. It's based on Hinduism. All right. And so all these books and all this wisdom and all this knowledge is coming into mankind today and he's and he's over he's overrun with it. He's flooded with it. If you ever lived in an age where people are literally uh, uh, inundated with 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 facts, it's today. It's unbelievable at the amount of information available today. It's just it's uh, it's absolutely mind boggling. But where did it come from? That's the key. They shall mingle themselves with the, son, with, the, with the seed of men. Now they're dealing with DNA. They're, they're trying now to man, manipulate DNA. By manipulating DNA, they're going to produce something. Transhumanism is part of this. The whole ideology and philosophy that we are masters of our destiny, that Charles Darwin essentially became the prophet of in the 1800s, that it's no longer the sovereign act of a sovereign God to make you what you are. Man must intervene and create his own world and his own environment. This is where the hybrid comes in. <laughs> the reason I said that is because I'm not so sure exactly how it's going to happen. I know what happened in Genesis 6. I know that the sons of God came into the daughters of men. The apostle says they left their first estate, their oikos, their house. They left that. They could not go back across the line once they had crossed over. Apparently, the beauty of the women in Genesis chapter number 6 overwhelmed these angels, and they came into the daughters of men and produced a hybrid race called Nephilim. And all these books out here today, they have different scenarios uh, about the return of the Nephilim, how they're going to come back. Is it going to be a spacecraft? Is it going to be through some scientific uh, lab experiment? Is it going to be the manipulation of DNA? All these things uh, are out there on the table, and they're looking at them today. Who can say? I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this. I do know that Daniel said knowledge will increase, and I know they're messing with something that's going to mess them up big time. Big time. Big time. And there's a whole lot of people out there right now who believe that the world already has hybrids in it. A hybrid. Neither a human nor, a, uh, nor an angel. But it gets you back to the demon. It brings you back to that. It brings you back to the mystery, the things that, that you cannot define and explain. What is a demon? Where did it come from? Because we know where the angels are that kept not their first estate. Where are they? They're in Tartarus. They're in the lowest hell. That's what it says in Peter. Reserved in chains of darkness. In the lowest hell. So obviously from that hell has compartments and degrees. Yes, sir. Uh, 
objects possessed, or the demons possessed these objects, and they had to smash them into powder so that they couldn't be resurrected. Well, you see, uh, if, if from everything that I've read about the, uh, the occult, is that symbols, dates, are very important to the occultist because they represent something. And by representing it, you focus on it, you set your mind on it, and you become part of it because you embrace it. And then you begin to speak to it and speak about it. And when words start coming forth from your mouth, then you start getting in trouble big time. This is why he that will confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in his heart that God raised him from the dead, he shall be saved. The confession that comes forth from the mouth connects you with the one that you're confessing. Yeah. It's not a plaything. Demonic possession and demonic uh, uh, influence is a powerful thing. And I think that uh, when you get into symbols, you better, this is why the Christian church, uh, even to this day, the only symbol of the Christian church that has been universally accepted by most Christians is a cross. You see ichthus. You see that ichthus is the fish, the Greek word for fish, ichthus. It's an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God. All right, Jesus Christ, Savior, Son of God. Uh, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. I forget exactly the, the, the order of, the, uh, of it. But the idea is that in the first few centuries after Christ, because they were persecuted so much, the Christians found a way to communicate with each other without saying anything, they put a fish up. The fish became a universally accepted symbol among Christians of, uh, of their faith in Christ. All right, that's fine. I mean, I have no problem with somebody with a fish or ichthus or all of that. But the thing is, when it comes to our faith in Christ and our faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we don't need anything We don't need anything. We don't need diamonds within circles or pyramids within circles or all this other stuff that you see. You don't need any of it. I'm not up here this morning trying to run anybody down, condemn a bunch of stuff, but I'll tell you that. You're not bound to anything because the God we serve is an invisible being. Invisible. That's one of the mysteries of the Christian faith. That's where a pagan world has a hard time understanding that. You worship a God nobody can see. Yes, but you see him in your soul. For the Holy Spirit makes him real in your heart. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's, 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 uh, that's one of the uh, characteristics of our faith in Christ. So the, uh, the idea that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, I believe, is a direct reference to demonic influence, however it's manifested in these last days. Whatever, whatever particular specific way that this is going to cross over the barrier and produce a hybrid race yeah. is what's going on in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, Daniel chapter number 2. I believe what's happening here is, the, is producing a hybrid race, a mixture of humanity and wicked, malicious spirit beings. And what is a demon? The spirits, disembodied spirits of a pre-Adamite race, wicked dead, fallen angels, a uh, few other suggestions. Nobody knows for certain. Nobody. I firmly, uh, as I read the Bible, study it, and over the years that I've studied it, believe that in Genesis chapter number 1, what you are reading is a, re, is a restoration and a recreation of an original creation. That there was on this earth before Adam something that caused it to become without form and void. For it says plainly in Isaiah, he did not create it without form and void. And Satan in some way was a viceroy over this earth. He was some kind of a, of a magistrate, a god that ruled over the earth. And what was on this earth before Adam, I don't know. I don't know. 
But I do know that when God made Adam, on the sixth day he brought him up from the dust of the ground, breathed into his body the breath of life, he became a living soul. The uh, Adam then became the direct object of Satan's hatred. And he went after him to destroy him. But when he came after him, he did not come after him as Satan, which means adversary. He came after him as a Nachash. That's what it says in the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Genesis 3. The Nachash, translated serpent. The Hebrew word Nachash means a shining, brilliant being. Yeah. Not, a, not a serpent crawling on the ground. A shining, brilliant being. And he came first to Eve. And the apostle tells us in Timothy that Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. He says it plainly, the apostle Paul. So this shining, brilliant being got to Adam through his bride. And he caused the fall of mankind. Now, of course, God knew in the beginning this would all happen. And what he has planned for the future will manifest his glory and his wisdom. That right now through the church is mani manifested the manifold wisdom of God. They did. Curious arts and all that stuff. Yeah. Where did it, where did it come? Where'd it come from? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, they had a book burning like you wouldn't believe. Oh, yeah. Now think about what he just said right there. So he brought up a very good point. In the book of Acts, it talks about how the apostles, when they went out and they began to preach, that they brought these books, they brought them by thousands, piled them up, and they burned them. These books were occultic, and they, they, they were occultic in nature. They were opposed to the wisdom of God, to the true revelation of Scripture. All right. Where then? Where then did the revelation that you've got in your hands, the Bible, that has a common theme from Genesis to Revelation, where did that come from? If you'll read Alfred Edersheim's, two books that I want to recommend to you, Alfred Edersheim, a converted Jew that lived in the 1800s, G.H. Pember. These two men wrote, wrote uh, a number of books, but the two that are the most important as far as I'm concerned is Edersheim's book on the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. It's about that thick. You can get it on CD-ROM. He goes into detail about what the Jews believed 2,000 years ago about demons, fallen angels, all this stuff. What the common belief was among the Jews. And it is totally different from what you've got in your Bible. Because they had been corrupted by all of this garbage you're talking about right here. And G.H. Pember, his book called Earth's Earliest Ages. We have it in the library. If we don't, we need to get four or five copies of it. It is one of the best books. It was written in the 1800s by G.H. Pember. It goes into detail about the pre-Adamite world before Adam was made, about the fallen angels, about demons, it goes into the material that is, you read it and you think, my goodness, this man wrote this yesterday. And he wrote it 140 years ago. G.H. Pember. You read these two books and you will come out of there, with, having read those two books, with a firm foundation in what's happening right now. Right now around you. These kids out here today are into vampires, werewolves, ghosts. They're, this stuff... Uh, they, they are fascinated with it, yet they are, they are so secular in their mind. They're not interested in salvation, God, <coughs> but they are fascinated with the occult world. Where'd that come from? There's a connection there. Yes, sir.
uh, from eight tracks and all this other stuff, and they would burn them. We had bonfires to burn them. But now they're in the church. Yeah, isn't that something? They're in the church now. Well, the emerging church movement, as I've mentioned to you before, the emerging church is all about a mystical experience with the spirit world, not necessarily a born-again experience of salvation, a mystical experience in the spirit world. They'll get you in trouble. <laughs> yes? Yes, I believe that, because in Ephesians 6 it says the battle of principalities not flesh and blood. Okay, so say we're at home praying or, or trying to read our Bible, uh -huh. and we feel the demons because of the sin we've committed in our homes or, or the things we've allowed to go on in our homes, we feel like there's demons there. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Mm -hmm. How do we get that out of there? Okay. Listen to my message this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you exactly by the grace of God I'll tell you how to go to war alright so a demon is a daimonion and it's an evil malicious uh, vicious spirit unclean spirit the King James Bible folks never uses the word demon it takes the word demon and translates it Remember that. There's a reason for that. It doesn't leave it hanging up in the, you know, in the sky, uh, left for you to translate. He translated. They translate it. And they translate it always in a bad context. Never in a good context. Always bad. So what's that mean? That means I don't want a demon. I don't want anything to do with them. <laughs> I don't want to round them. Don't want them. Yeah, the familiar spirit's quite a thing, but I know what you're talking about. There is a word for it. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It was a good thing to have. Desirable. Yeah. When you get on these things, they just one thing leads to another. Okay. Well, we're about out of time. And uh, I mean, hopefully we've covered some ground in here this morning. What goes in these eyes comes into the soul. What comes into the soul is cleared by the spirit that dominates your life. If the Holy Ghost is dominating your life, it is ejected, rejected. If the spirit of man is dominating your life, it's considered and then eventually received. And then you've given place to the devil. And once you give place to the devil, he doesn't give up that place very easily. Because what he does, when you give him a place, he makes a stronghold out of it. And a stronghold, it's like you, it's like you assaulting a fort. You know, he doesn't have to go anywhere. You have to, you have to, you have to get over the walls and get into him, through the moats and all that. And so Satan builds strongholds in your life if you give him a place. And so that's why the Bible says, give no place to the devil. Give no, give, don't give me any place. All right, we'll have word prayer. We'll let you go. Brother Lee, will you dismiss us, please?